Welcome to the Investor Download, the podcast about the themes driving markets and the economy now and in the future. I'm your host, David Brett. Given events in the Middle East, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, worsening relations between the US and China and instability in Africa, we thought it would be a good time to speak to General Sir Nick Carter about unfolding events. Sir Nick is a former senior British Army officer who also served as Chief of the Defence Staff and served as a commanding officer during conflicts in Bosnia and Kosovo in the late 1990s. So he's well positioned to speak on current geopolitical events and he came to London to have a chat with me. So Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to the building. No, it's a pleasure, David. It's good to be with you. I'm afraid we've got to start with what's happening in Israel. Um, I just want to start, obviously it's a massive topic and there are plenty of other podcasts out there that can cover it in a lot more detail than we can right at this moment in time. I'll, I'll probably point people to the rest is politics. We've done about four or five podcasts already on it. So if people want the history of the conflict, by all means, uh, trials where this is more about why now and what might happen in the future. So, so Nick, c- can you just take us through why Hamas might have targeted Israel at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, obviously it's a speculation, but I should think there are sort of three or four reasons why now was good timing from their perspective. I mean, the first one of which I think was that they, they were obviously worried that the Arab world was drifting into Israel's ambit. And we saw that through the Abraham Accords. And of course, there was much talk of a potential deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia brokered by the US government. Um, So I think, you know, that was something they obviously wanted to disrupt. Um, I think the second reason, perhaps, um, is clearly um, Iran would see it that same way. And there's absolutely no evidence that Iran's fingerprints are over this thing at all. But obviously, Hamas has been funded by them in the past. And one might ask a question about all of that. Um, I think the third reason is, of course, that Israel appears to have been quite distracted over the last seven or eight months. Um, there have been some real question marks about Israel's democracy with the Netanyahu government um, bringing in legislation perhaps to constrain the powers and the authority of the Supreme Court, which was a pretty, you know, significant check on, uh, on sort of things that the government might do in relation to the democracy. So distraction, I think, was there. And then I think, you know, the, the timing was, of course, interesting in historical terms, uh, 50 years on from Yom Kippur, which... You know, some Arabs might have regarded as a victory, but most probably didn't. Uh, So this is, you know, good kudos for Hamas, perhaps, to show that they can still carry the Arab flag in the way they did. And then I think the other reason, of course, is that um, the Palestinian Authority, which was generated by the Oslo Accords in the 90s, is an enemy of Hamas. And the fact that what I suspect would have come out of the deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia would have been some pressure on Israel to make some concessions to the Palestinian Authority was not something that Hamas would have would have approved of at all. And I, you know, finally, you know, frustrations boil over. Um, you know, there's not been much progress in Gaza over the last few years, and quite clearly, that's something that is on people's minds. At this stage, does it feel like it could end up like a long war? Um, well, I mean, it, 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 that's an interesting question in all sorts of ways. I mean, I, I think, first of all, um, one needs to recognise that this is a continuation of something that's been going on for many generations already. Um, and the answer is that um, wars, to use that term, uh, are only ever really concluded in conversations and through political settlements. And I think the big question that will be raised throughout this is the extent to which the Israeli government is thinking the thing through to the finish and is prepared perhaps to talk about a a political settlement. Um, And that ultimately will determine uh, how long this thing goes on for. Um, So I think, you know, far too early to say, but, you know, um, at the moment, you know, we're in a moment of crisis uh, and people make decisions during moments of crisis, which sometimes can precipitate other crises. I think the hope for all of us looking in, um, in a humanitarian um, view is that political settlement might be on people's agendas. Um, so I was going to say, just around the section off on Israel, what do you think the potential outcomes might be? Well, I, I mean, I, the straight answer is I, I think it's very difficult to predict. Um, I mean, I think whichever way we look at it, this is a, a, a ghastly human tragedy. Uh, and the attack that Hamas mounted on Israel was truly shocking. Uh, and um, I think all of us who 
understand these sorts of things was flabbergasted by their behaviour. Now, of course, um, the big challenge that Israel now has is having declared a political objective of wishing to destroy Hamas. The real challenge, of course, is that if you're then going to have to enter uh, Gaza uh, with a population of 2.2 million people in an area, broadly speaking, the size of the Isle of Wight, very urbanised, uh, with a huge amount of tunnels and high-rise buildings, um, uh, up against, I don't know, 20 to 40,000 Hamas fighters who are probably well-trained, well I guess by now quite well-equipped. You know, the military options are um, unattractive, um, shall we say, in all sorts of ways. And of course, the real risk is a humanitarian disaster. Um, and we see that, in a sense, slightly unfolding at the moment with the requirement for half the population of Gaza to leave northern Gaza and head towards the Rafa crossing into Egypt. Um, and how that plays out, um, you know, is anybody's guess. So, you know, the options aren't good, um, and they're particularly not good if you're, if you're Mr Netanyahu, who is already clearly worried about his own personal political future. I think the other thing that we should be conscious of is that we do not want this uh, war to expand uh, or to escalate. And there are significant risks um, of uprisings on the West Bank and, of course, rioting and that sort of stuff in eastern Jerusalem. And, of course, there is the problem of Hezbollah in uh, southern Lebanon and whether or not they choose to enter the war. We're very much determined by their Iranian sponsor and whether the Iran is prepared to accept that um, Hezbollah's role in providing deterrence for Iran um, is something that could be put to one side for maybe an expansion of the war. So I think um, that is an area that we just need to be really conscious of. Uh, and that will undoubtedly be connected to the way in which Israel is responding over the course of the next few days. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you're listening to the Investor Download. Let's move on to the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, we're nearly two years in now. Where are we at with that war? Well, um, I mean, the, the straight answer is that on the battlefield, um, neither side has been able during the course of this year, this summer in particular, to do anything particularly decisive. Um, and of course, Ukraine has received um, a significant amount of Western training and equipment over the course of the summer. Um, and of course, you know, much of the propaganda um, before uh, this summer occurred was that Ukraine would be able to use this newfound capability to be able to do something decisive on the battlefield in some form of spring or summer offensive. And of course, what has been revealed is that the nature of war doesn't change. Um, you know, Russia has had nine months or so to prepare formidable defences uh, in the parts of the Donbass that Russia still holds. Um, and those formidable defences, Ukraine understandably has found very difficult to penetrate, uh, and therefore progress has been slow and very limited. And of course, what we now see unfolding uh, in the Donetsk region of the Donbass is a counter-Russian offensive, um, because Russia is obviously trying to pull Ukraine's reserves away from its own offensive, and indeed maybe to make a bit more progress in trying to seize those bits of the Donbass that Ukraine took back off Russia in September of last year. So the answer is um, we've got a war of attrition on that battlefield. Uh, I don't think there'll be any decisive outcomes on the battlefield uh, before winter closes in, and then I doubt we'll see much progress in any way before next spring. Now, of course, the big challenge uh, for Ukraine is the extent to which uh, Western support uh, remains firmly behind Ukraine. Uh, we're already seeing, of course, uh, as a result of the defenestration of Senator McCarthy, that the funding that President Biden wished Ukraine to receive this side of Christmas is now under threat uh, in Congress. Uh, and, of course, we're also seeing um, one or two divisions, perhaps, in Europe's position over all of this. Um, and, you know, the change of government in Slovakia, for example, allied to a Hungary support, uh, uh, Hungary that is relatively supportive of Russia. These are all fault lines in the EU. So whether or not the European Union and Europe more broadly is able to make up for what uh, the United States uh, is not able to deliver, I think remains to be seen. So I think there are question marks about, about the support. But then to be fair, there are also question marks about how strong um, the Russian polity is, given that um, President Putin had to deal with uh, Mr. Prigozhin and his rebellion uh, a couple of months ago. You know, how strong is the axis around Mr. Putin and how patient are they uh, in a war that's not necessarily going anywhere that quickly? So I think there are, you know, there are obviously some question marks there. But I think anybody who thinks this is going to end quickly 
um, is deluding themselves. Um, I don't think it will, uh, and I think there'll need to be some real change in dynamics for that to happen. Um, and if Ukraine is able, in the attacks it's making into Russia's depth in Moscow and more broadly in Russia, and of course in Crimea, to undermine Russian morale, then that might change things. But I'm afraid at the moment my expectation is, is that we're going to be in a similar position as we are now for probably the next six months, with Ukraine going to be very challenged by Russian missile attacks on its infrastructure, and in particular on its electricity system, which will be tough if we get a bad winter. Can a peaceful resolution be achieved? Well, um, I think it's an interesting question. I was sharing a platform uh, the other day with Professor Stephen Kotkin, who is one of America's leading experts on Russia and indeed has written some very good books on Stalin. And he was asked on that panel, in a word, whether he thought that a peaceful outcome was possible whilst Mr Putin was in charge. And he answered the question by reminding people that President Yeltsin in the mid-1990s had been asked a question by a journalist in one word to tell them what Yeltsin thought of the state of Russia at the time. And Yeltsin thought for a minute and said, good. And the journalist said to him, well, in which case, he said, if I gave you two, wo two words, uh, what would you say? And Yeltsin thought for a minute and said, not good. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Kotkin's answer to the question in one word was maybe. And his answer in two words was maybe not. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we have to retain an open mind, I'm afraid, at this stage in things. Get in touch with us by email at shorterspodcasts at shorters.com or visit our website shorters.com forward slash the investor download. So let's move across to a different type of battlefield. We're going to talk about uh, China-US relations at the moment. Um, can you just highlight some of the areas of conflict there is currently between China and the US? I mean, that's obviously a factor um, and is a, is a cause of tension. But I think technology is probably the more obvious point of tension. Uh, and I think there are obviously uh, economic questions to be asked about some of the friendshoring and reshoring that, of course, um, the West and in particular the United States is doing as a consequence of what it's seen uh, over the last three years in its relationship with China. But I would focus on technology as being the area of greatest challenge. And of course, the Biden strategy of having a high wall and a small yard in terms of restricting China's access to semiconductors is a good example of this. But of course, you know, China is ahead in certain areas as well. So my own view is, is that the, the, the big tension that we have will not be over an initiative like China's Belt and Road Initiative. It will be rather over how the Chinese digital Silk Road has an impact upon those client states of China, which may well become ensnared in it because of their uh, desire to borrow money from China to achieve this effect. And when you consider that um, the year before last was the first year in which more data entered China than left it, you can see that China has a strategy to become perhaps um, the gold mine in, th in the world for data. And, and data is everything nowadays, as we all well understand. And when you then connect that to the fact that Beidou, or Big Dipper as it's called, which is the Chinese equivalent of GPS, is arguably more accurate in most of the capitals of the world at the moment than GPS is, you can see that the basis for Chinese smart cities on that sort of technology is pretty close. Um, and that clearly is a means through which Chinese ideology could very quickly hit um, populations outside China. So I think technology is undoubtedly a playing field on which this tension is going to play out and one that we need to watch. And then, of course, I think we need to be clear that, you know, China increasingly sees herself as a, as a, as a big time global player and a proper competitor for the United States in particular. And as a consequence of that, you can see um, the strings of pearls in terms of bases and ports and infrastructure that China is acquiring, whether that's in Sri Lanka, the port of Piraeus, um, you know, on the east coast of the Horn of Africa, or indeed now looking for, for bases on the west coast of Atlant the Atlantic. You can see China is, is, is spreading her tentacles um, in a bid to make sure that um, what she needs, particularly in terms of resources, can be reinforced by China's presence on the ground. Um, and that's going to cause tension. Um, and that's before you get into the Indo-Pacific itself. And are there any areas in which US and China are cooperating at the moment? Um, yes. And I think, you know, we, we should be reasonably um, confident that there are conversations occurring. Uh, and I think, you know, there is a realisation that, um, you know, in this sort of 
Thucydides style of problem that both parties recognise they need to be talking uh, in order to manage potential misunderstandings. And of course, you know, there are collaborative conversations over issues like climate change. Um, and, and, th and that's important. Um, and there are other areas where the United States and China talk as well. Um, but I mean, I think the problem we've got is that um, both sides of the American political divide um, do see um, China as a threat rather than perhaps simply a challenge. And the consequence of that is there's a risk that they will both try and out hawk each other. And that is um, a dangerous state of affairs. And what implications might that have on the global order? Well, of course, um, you know, if you've got a rising power and a superpower in place and they don't end up uh, talking to each other, the real problem is one of misunderstanding. And <clears throat> when you consider the way in which the military balance in the Indo-Pacific is now changing, whether that's Japan rearming, whether that's South Korea perhaps talking about nuclear weapons, whether that's the AUKUS deal between Australia, the United Kingdom and the US to give uh, Australia nuclear technology for its submarines, whether it's Australian rearmament, whether it's the quad arrangement with Japan, India, Australia, the United States. The, the plain fact is, is that um, you are seeing um, a great deal of military activity in particularly the um, South China Sea and adjacent areas, but also in the Indo-Pacific more broadly. And the risk of that is that you get miscalculation. Uh, and that's the bit that I think everybody needs to watch. It feels like the world is changing in you know, your professional opinion. Has it changed over the last 10, 20 years from what it was maybe back in the late 90s? I mean, I think if we look back to the 1990s, um, we lived in a unipolar world, really, in which the United States was prepared to play the role of global policeman. Um, we then, of course, had the big disruption of 9-11. And the upshot of all of that was that American foreign policy swung violently towards dealing with Afghanistan, Iraq, and what they called, I think inappropriately, the global war against terror. And of course, the next 20 years saw the United States fixed by this in many ways. Um, and of course, that led to the campaigns in Afghanistan, and Iraq, and it ultimately led perhaps to ISIS and all that we know with that. Um, so I think, you know, once the United States um, emerged from that experience. Of course, what had occurred is that revisionist powers like Russia, Iran, and certainly China, um, had begun to assert themselves um, in a more um, forthright way than perhaps um, had happened 10 or 15 years previously. And so where we now find ourselves, I think, is in a, is in a much more fractured world, a world of perhaps great power competition, reminiscent in many ways of what we saw in the 1930s. Uh, and we all know that that didn't end particularly well. So I think it's a, it's a more competitive world. Uh, it's a world in which um, some revisionist powers are seeking to assert themselves in ways that are counter to um, our view of our way of life. Um, and that means that the rules-based order, uh, the multilateral system that the United States and her allies created from 1945 onwards, is threatened. And, and if that order is threatened, uh, that's a very challenging position for all of us to be in. What do you think the probability is that China, uh, US and China might go to war over Taiwan? Um, I mean, I think the question is really is whether whether China, um, to quote Xi Jinping's rejuvenation, believes that um, she needs to take back Taiwan uh, to become part of China proper. Um, and I think you know, that is definitely a foreign policy objective uh, of Xi Jinping's government. The question, of course, is how they do it. Um, and I think at the moment that a coercive approach of political warfare and possibly disinformation and cyber and all this sorts of things associated with it, with perennial blockades, perhaps to make a point, is a more likely approach than some form of invasion. <clears throat> Not least because uh, an invasion of Taiwan is, A, an extraordinarily difficult military operation, and then, B, um, would be very risky. Um, and when you consider some of the headwinds that Xi Jinping is wrestling with in terms of the Chinese economy, and in particular its demography, uh, and when we consider that the working age population in China is going to decline by, say, 10% within the next 10 years and by 30% by 2050, and some people are predicting that the Chinese population will halve by the end of this century, it would be very risky to throw lots of young men and women into a very milit difficult military operation. 
so I, I think it's unlikely that he would want to do that unless he's driven to it through other means or unless we have a miscalculation. Um, and as a consequence of all of that, I think, I think we'll see a different strategy. I think, you know, he will have read his son, Sue, who memorably said that um, the supreme art of a strategy is to defeat your opponent without fighting. Uh, and I would have thought that that's more likely to be the approach. But that does depend upon reasonable people taking reasonable decisions and there being no miscalculation. We'll move on to the very final part of the show, and that's moving on to Africa, so not making things any easier for you. There's been a lot of coups and a lot of change of governments in Africa over the last few years. What are the main drivers of this instability? Yes, I mean, most of the coups have taken place in um, Francophone countries, um, whether that's uh, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso or Gabon. Um, And I think there's probably a bit of a reason for that. I think that... um, You know, French policy has been different in its exit from empire to British policy. Uh, And I think that some African populations have got somewhat fed up with the view that there are these slightly dynastic governments that are close to the French government who've been in power. uh, And they believe that it's time for something else. And of course, um, that's why I think we've seen four military coups in the last three years. Now, that's, though, not the principal reason for instability in the region. Um, We've seen a a great deal of um, Islamic extremism emerging in the Sahel, um, and that is a, there's now a band of it that extends really from Eastern Africa all the way through those countries in the Sahara, right over to um, Nigeria. Um, And that um, phenomenon um, is one that is um, very destabilizing for weakish African governments. And when you then overlay on top of that other factors like serious organised crime and um, you know, the appetite of populations to want to migrate and move, and of course with modern information systems they all know that the quality of life in Europe is rather different to the quality of life they're experiencing in Africa. And if you then combine that with the effects of climate change, you, know, and you need to have a look at what Lake Chad looked like 50 years ago and compare to what it looks like now in satellite imagery, and you'll realise that much of the old traditional grazing Um, that um, traditional herdsmen depended upon for their livestock is now disappearing. And that, of course, pushes them into areas where farmers believe they own the rights to the land. And that creates tension and creates real problems in terms of feeding populations. So I think you've got a whole multiplicity of factors that are at play there, um, none of which is helped by very weak governance and, in many ways, failed states. Um, And, of course, the challenge that this part of Africa has is that, you know, um, leaders in Europe are distracted by other things. Um, And um, whilst they might worry about migration, um, the reality, of course, is that the population of Africa is expanding more rapidly than on any other continent. And by 2050, it will represent 25% of the world's population. And unless some of these symptoms that I've described can be fixed... I suspect that we've only seen the beginnings of migration, uh, particularly across um, the um, Mediterranean, but also, I suspect, further north in Europe as well. And the only way to resolve this, to be honest, is for Europe to think pretty strategically about how it helps Africans live a proper life in Africa. What can countries or organisations do to help with stability in Africa? Um, Well, it's not easy because, um, because, you know, Africans are not necessarily... Uh, that enthusiastic on the sort of um, aid that um, people have tried to deliver over the last generation or two. But the reality is that we have to find a way of helping Africans become more effective at governing. Um, And if we can help them become more effective at governing, then they will have, I think, a better approach to security, to stability and therefore to prosperity and make it more likely that Africans will want to stay in their own parts of Africa. Uh, But they'll need help to do it and they'll need money to do it um, and it'll need to be done in a strategic and thoughtful fashion. How might that affect the world order? Well, I think it's going to have an impact, A, on Europe with greater um, migration happening. But it also plays into um, a new scramble for Africa in a way because you've got a lot of precious resources, whether that's rare earths or precious metals in Africa, which um, the world needs um, if it's going to um, bring in the technologies we need for 
um, green strategies and to deal with climate change. And of course, what you see happening is countries like Russia utilising proxies like the Wagner Military Security Group, and indeed China, of course, um, trying to find ways of securing these resources. And of course, um, the West has woken up to this now. Indeed, the United States in at the World Mining Conference in January this year in South Africa had the largest delegation it's ever sent to the World Mining Conference. So there's clearly a realisation there that there's, there's something that needs to be done. So there's that scramble occurring, and that will have a have an impact upon um, you know, world stability. Um, so a number of factors at play there, I would say. Plenty for people to be thinking about, and obviously lots of concerns out there as well. Uh, General Sinek Carter, thank you so much for chatting to us today. It's a pleasure, David. Thank you. Well, that was the show. We very much hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more, please head to schroders.com forward slash insights. And we're endeavouring to record as many of these shows in the studio on video. And if you want to watch them in their full unabridged version, uh, then go to Schroder's YouTube channel. If you want to get in touch with us, it's Schroder's podcast at schroders.com. And remember, you can listen, subscribe and review the Investor Download wherever you get your podcasts. New shows drop every Thursday at 5pm UK time. But above all, keep safe and go well. Cheers. The value of investments and the income from them may go down as well as up. And investors may not get back the amounts originally invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The information is not an offer, solicitation or recommendation of any funds, services or products or to adopt any investment strategy. 